Hello, this is Melva Tate with Tate & Associates, and this is Sexual Harassment Training for Marion Military Institute. Again, I'm Melva Tate. I'm a human capital strategist and the owner of Tate & Associates. We service clients all across the U.S., predominantly in our footprint of Alabama, Central Alabama. And our whole mission is to cultivate people and the places that they work. So we're delighted to bring this sexual harassment training to Mary Military Institute. Our objectives are pretty clear. I want you to understand what sexual harassment is. We'll talk about sexual harassment under Title VII, also under Title IX. Recognize why it's important to prevent sexual harassment at Marion Military Institute and also talk about the policies that you currently have in place in addressing issues of sexual harassment and discrimination. So this is part of your compliance training and certainly as an employer, Marion Military Institute has the responsibility to maintain a workplace that's free from any form of sexual harassment or sexual discrimination. Not only is it a part of good business practice and something that it prides itself on to have the right culture, but it's also a requirement from the government um, to follow Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and also Title IX to ensure that there is no sexual harassment that goes on in the workplace. And of course, our goal in sharing this training with you today is to raise your awareness so that we can prevent any type of harassment from being able to flourish in the workplace and of course that creates a lot of issues including poor employee morale, low productivity, um, turnover, and also lawsuits. So that's why we're sharing this with you today. And Marion Military Institute has again several policies and procedures that address the importance on preventing sexual harassment, and if it happens, what you should do to report it. So I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with that policy, you go back to your policy manual handbook and look at section 3.5, which address this issue in detail. And we'll talk a little bit about what some of it, specific information in that policy as we go along through this process. So sexual harassment, what do we mean when we talk about sexual risk harassment? We're clearly talking about unwelcome sexual advances or requests for sexual favors. We're also talking about the environment that the person is in and whether that conduct is physical or verbal um, and it affects that individual's employment. It unreasonably interferes with their flow of work, their performance, they find it intimidating or even hostile in that environment. So let's look at what a couple of those incidents. So there are two forms that we're going to talk about. Sexual harassment is the first one. Um, quid pro quo. Quid pro quo simply means you this, do this for me, I'll do this for you. So the first issue that we talk about with quid pro quo is usually someone in authority offering another person generally a subordinate, tangible benefits, for sexual favors. So if you do this for me, I will give you money, I will give you a pay increase, I will give you a promotion, uh, a higher salary, I will give you a preferred shift schedule, I will allow you to go to this conference or this training, something tangible that that employee who is generally the sub subordinate can benefit from if they perform a sexual favor, whether that's a sexual act, sexual words, whatever that situation may be. And on the flip side of the quid pro quo, we have not only the tangible benefits, but the repercussions if that person will not comply to a request for sexual favors. Meaning if you don't do this for me, allow me to rub on your body parts or give me oral sex or whatever that situation or that request may be, then that person suffers the repercussions. You're going to be fired from your job. You're going to be demoted. There's threats of you being downsized because downsizing is a possibility for the department or the organization and you're going to be first on the list. 
So whatever detrimental treatment can come to that person, negative reviews, a negative performance review, a negative reference, anything that's detrimental to that person because they, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you, and they did not comply. Of course, then we have the issue of the hostile work environment. So we generally see more cases of hostile work environment than quid pro quo. So the hostile work environment, again, someone's touching you, invading your personal space. Every time they see you, they've got to give you a full frontal hug. Those things. So the physical contact rub against you pretty close. Um, even if they're trying to do it on the slide and, and not necessarily reveal that they're trying to touch on you or feel on you. But again, the personal contact that makes you uncomfortable. So they don't touch you, but they just look at you and stare. So the leering, every time you walk by, someone's making a comment or just staring and leering at you, which makes you uncomfortable. And these things are pretty obvious. Again, um, and it's not just a situation where there's the men who are committing acts of misconduct or inappropriate acts related to sexual harassment, sexual discrimination. Women can do it as well. Verbal abuse, sexual abuse, calling someone a B-I-T-C-H or calling someone a fag. You're angry, so you use abusive sexual terms to degrade that person. Another form of a hostile work environment. The jokes. You're not degrading them, but you're just trying to be funny. You're just trying to lighten the mood, but you use inappropriate jokes and comments about someone. So the jokes are inappropriate. And even not only the jokes that are told in person, but we'll also talk about the jokes that are sent via email and electronic devices. Which gets me to <laughs> the electronic devices. So not only sexting, sending inappropriate pictures or comments, but also sending inappropriate jokes or anything else of a sexual nature that would make that person feel uncomfortable. And it's solely inappropriate based on the organization's policies and procedures. Inappropriate pictures. So if I'm a fan of Magic Mike 1 and 2 and I'm on a picture of Channing Tatum in my office with his best Magic Mike impression or if you're a fan of Kim Kardashian and the fact that she supposedly broke the internet with her pictures and you want to post that or use it as your screensaver, inappropriate. And then the who. So we often talk about, well, who are these people that we're referring to when we talk about sexual harassment, so the violators, people who are committing acts against others, can be employees at all levels. It could be students, contractors, visitors, customers. They can be male or female. Again, 20 years ago, we predominantly talked about men being the aggressor in cases of sexual harassment, and that's not the case today. Um, the victims um, could be administrators, staff, co-workers, students, and or witnesses. So again, some of the same people who can be violators can also be the victim of it. And the demographics could be male on female, which again was the traditional way. Old, young, student to student, employee to student, and student to employee could be male on male, female on female, female to male, or male to female. So again, it does not matter as long as you have two responsible individuals who are committing, and one may commit an act of inappropriate conduct or even assault that falls under sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. And where could be anywhere. So if you look around your facility, whether that's an office, a library, a lab, a hallway, a vehicle, on campus, anything else, even outside. So trips away on official business, retreats, Hotel, cars, at a conference, again, it just not, it's not ex exclusive to the physical address of the organization where sexual harassment can take place. 
And then the why. So a lot of studies have been conducted to try to understand why sexual harassment happens in the workplace. And clearly, we know that there are cases of inappropriate conduct, like the jokes or texting. Someone just, unfortunately, makes poor, a poor judgment call and would send something inappropriate thinking it was funny. Um, in most cases, especially when we're talking about a person in authority who's abusing a subordinate, it's an issue of power and dominance. And so I referenced a case that I investigated in um, Alabama involving, well, was at an automotive manufacturing company and involved a young lady who all of the accusers, there were four accusers, two male supervisors, two male co-workers, and each one of them doing the interview said that they did not do what they had been accused of doing because the young lady was unattractive. And it just amazed me that they would use whether the person was attractive or not to validate or be their excuse or evidence on why they did not perform the act. Clearly, um, once the investigation was done, um, there was enough evidence and the credibility was in question to justify finding that the abuse actually took place. Um, and it was interesting that the young lady was not very attractive. She'd had a hard life. But what I want to really point out is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So whether that person is someone who you may deem unattractive or someone um, who's naturally beautiful with a little makeup can look extremely beautiful, that's, beauty is not the issue in this case. It's usually an issue of power and dominance. Um, so keep that in mind, especially if you're one who has a complaint that's brought to you. And oftentimes we find it hard to believe. We see this a lot when we talk about celebrities or athletes who've been accused of misconduct, particularly sexual assault, sexual harassment. And you look at the two and say, well, it's hard to believe that he would want to harass her. And that's not the case. So I want to dispel that myth pretty clearly. And I want to just jump right in and talk a little bit about Title IX right now as we continue to lay, lay the foundation for sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. So clearly under Title VII, we talked about what that looks like. Under Title IX, it's very similar. Title IX is one of the education amendments under 1972, most people related to allowing women to participate in sports and have equal rights in sports. But one of the things that you have to remember is that it is not exclusive to athletics. So it includes admission, recruitment, counseling, discipline, but it's not just an athletic um, amendment or title or regulation. It covers any organization, um, educational program or activity that's receiving federal financial assistance. So again, any organization, educational program or activity that's receiving federal financial assistance falls under Title IX. It's not just your athletes. And again, very similar to Title VII, you know, prohibits discrimination on the on the basis of sex, sexual assault, battery, coercion, all of those things fall under it. And one of the things to keep in mind that if a student or a parent who feel that they've been violated decides that they don't want to report the incident or don't want to move forward with it or even participate in the investigation, the school still has a responsibility to investigate with the information that they have and close out the case or take whatever um, protective actions or repercussions that may fall once the investigation is done. It is not the individual who initially brings the complaint or um, their willingness to follow through with the investigation that determines on whether investigation is held. They must do it. And of course, with your institution, that um, every institution must have a Title IX coordinator and yours is lower level. So make sure that she is getting those complaints. And if not, um, you put your school at risk. 
Um, if you don't follow or report incidents or if the school does not take appropriate action to make sure that the sexual harassment has stopped or whether that was a valid case or claim of sexual harassment. So the school has the responsibility. And also I want to point out in your policy, there are some procedures in your policies and procedures on sexual harassment. It talks about consensual and sexual relationships or romantic relationships. Um, um, oftentimes when we investigate issues and I've investigated Title VII and Title IX issues, particularly on Title IX when it involves a student with an employee or faculty member, oftentimes the faculty member or the, the person that is in a, some form of authority or um, the more senior individual will say, well, it was consensual. Well, your policy simply states that it is prohibited simply because Marion Institute Marion Military Institute want every college professional, not professor, but professional, anyone working at the institute to ensure that they hold a high ethical and moral standard and tone and, and they set the tone for the campus. So it's very important that although you may feel that these relationships are consensual, they are still um, prohibited simply because the organization wants to maintain a tone and the culture on the campus that is clearly ethical and moral. So, in other words, don't try to find your spouse or your significant other or someone that you're willing to have a sexual or romantic relationship with at the Institute. So a couple of behavior zones. I'm going to go through these real fast because, again, when we start talking about sexual harassment, and people think it's all hands off or I can't say anything. I can't compliment a person. Um, you know, it, we've got to be very rigid in the way that we interact with our coworkers and with other individuals that are on campus. And that is not what we're saying or preaching here. So green zone, certainly these are behaviors that are very important to developing relationships. Polite touching, of course, we're in the South, so we tend to touch someone on the shoulder, someone on the elbow, give them a pat as a form of greeting. So those things are certainly okay, especially if the person has not told you that they're offended by it or seem uncomfortable with the touching. Social interaction, showing concern for someone, a polite compliment, hey, that color looks great on you, oh, I love your new haircut. Those things are totally okay and appropriate. So when we get into the yellow zone, we call that the slippery slope because it can go from one situation to another pretty quickly, depending on the circumstances and the individuals. So the thing I want you to keep in mind about the yellow zone behavior, if someone tells you that they're uncomfortable with it and it's repeated, chances are it could become sexual harassment. So violating a person's personal space, you're constantly getting all up on someone. I recommend using the three feet rule if you can't hold your hand out in front of that person without touching them, then that, that space has probably been invaded by you or that other person. Whistling at someone, questions about someone's personal life. We've already talked about the jokes, the posters, the leering and staring are all things that could be offensive to someone, especially if they tell you that the behavior is not want, wanted or welcome. Repeated requests for dates. This is another one that gets individuals at tr in trouble at work. Um, if someone says that they're not interested, chances are they're not interested and they're not going to change their mind within a week or two. So again, um, wearing, excuse me, unwanted emails of a sexual nature, suggestive touching, sitting, or gestures are all things that fall in the yellow zone. And then the red zone is pretty clear. Um, chances are if you commit one of these acts, then um, it is clearly sexual harassment. Once the investigation is followed through, and you will, in most cases, lose your job or be demoted. So sexual favors in return for employment or rewards, we call that quid pro quo. Same thing with threats of losing your job or your position if you don't follow through. Sending sexual explicit pornographic pictures or emails and this include things whether you send them or not but if they're found on your computer 
or if you're the one who creates a virus within the um, organization on um, the server and the computer system because you're watching pornographic material at work and if it's traced back to your computer chances are that you can use lose your job or be demoted um, because the computer and again these emails any um, equipment that's used on the job for the job belongs to the organization and then of course criminal con um, conduct or sexual assault we know that's clearly grounds for termination and it's in the red zone so the fear factor is another issue that we talk about when we deal with issues of sexual harassment and why that individual won't come forward Number one is fear of losing their job. They just don't want to take the risk of losing their source of income. Fear of retaliation. Um, what's going to happen to me if I report this? Will I be moved to another department? Will I be demoted? Will people stop talking to me? Will I be isolated? Fear of getting someone in trouble. It's their friend. They sent the joke. It, you know, they were just joking. It's always funny. They're always trying to be funny, but it was certainly inappropriate and I was offended by it. Fear of disrupting the workplace. Again, we see this a lot when we talk about Title IX athletics. We don't want that basketball player, that football player to get in trouble, mm -hmm. so we don't report it. Fear of being accused of not having a sense of humor kind of goes back to getting someone in trouble. Fear being embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed, nor do I want things in my past brought up as part of this investigation to some way find me at fault for what has happened. Fear of feeling less of a woman or a man by reporting the incident. Oh, you should be flattered that they find you attractive. Or as a guy, hey, you know, you should be able to stand up for yourself. And again, we talk about sexual harassment. We know that men are, are harassed at a greater number these days than, than in the past. So men also have validation in some cases of bringing for a sexual harassment complaint. And then there's the fear of not being believed. Um, again, the example that I gave with the young lady being not attractive and others using that as their justification of not harassing her. Um, and, and the reason once she was interviewed, she said that I just didn't think people would believe me because of her past so that becomes a big issue when it comes to discrimination and sexual harassment someone else's perception of an event may differ from our own and so what do you see so some of you may see a male face and some of you may see the word liar so for organizations to eliminate sexual harassment or the fear factor you've got to have an inclusive environment where individuals feel free to come forward and talk about not only the treatment that they receive but also what they've witnessed as well and long gone are the environments like mad men or if you remove remember the movie with dolly pardon working nine to five where these situations were allowed to continue and other people knew about it and those who were subjected to that type of behavior just simply had to deal with it. We're living in a new environment now and our employees expect a whole lot more of their work environment and the people that they work around and certainly the leaders within that organization. And again, as we deal with issues of um, transgender employees, individuals with a different sexual orientation, those things are not going away. So as we saw the transition of Bruce Jenner um, and then his connection with the Kardashians and then now he says call me Caitlyn, um, those issues, although they seem far-fetched and in Hollywood, could eat, if they're not already at your doorstep, will be there. And our objective and certainly having an inclusive environment that's free of discrimination is knowing how to accept these individuals for the talent that they bring to the organization and not discriminate against them. And my piece of advice has always been um, the three P's. If you if you think about sending a text or t texting or sexting or making a joke. If you would not say it in front of your pastor, your priest, your parent, or the police, then don't do it. 
If you would not say it, show it, have them view it, your pastor, your priest, your parent, or your police, then don't do it. So, some things that you should not do, should not do. Address others in demeaning terms. That's pretty clear. Aggressively hugging, aggression against another person's body. Again, if that's you, if you love touching and feeling on someone, or if it's just that one person, the new new young lady in your department or the new guy, then you need to stop it. Rubbing a person's back or shoulders, although I enjoy good massage um, in the workplace, it's inappropriate particularly if that person has told you that they're uncomfortable with you touching them like that asking probing questions about a person's personal life or their personal matters inappropriate don't divulge intimate details about your own professional life or personal life um, this is where we have a lot of issues around employee relations where someone has told their co-workers too much information and if they Start questioning them or commenting about it or telling others it becomes an issue. So keep your personal business to yourself. Um, sexual oriented jokes, um, flirting, pinching, patty, all those things. And even wearing suggestive or um, exposing clothing. Now, this is an issue often some uh, females, when I do this training, get a bit upset. But if you're putting your body parts on display, as if you're asking for comment or opinion, meaning that you've got extra large breasts and you're wearing a very low cut top and you've got body piercings and other things that can be visibly viewed and you're in violation of the company's dress code policy. Most policies say will say no tight or revealing clothing and yet you're doing that and someone says something to you, it's hard to be offended by that. Not that it's justifiable, but we have to own some piece of it too. So um, generally this question, this comment usually is made toward women, but men can be in the same situation as well. And what they, they're wearing, if you don't want someone to comment on that particular piece of clothing or that body part that should be covered by that clothing, then, then use a little bit of professionalism in what you wear. The very short skirts, again, someone may not be monitoring you or cautioning you every day with a ruler, hey, that skirt is too short. But again, if you're wearing a very short, short skirt and someone makes a comment about being able to see a part of your leg that's inappropriate, my point is be professional about where you, the way you dress and follow the company's dress code. And if we don't address these issues, we know that we risk losing employees. Certainly, if they feel that they can't come forward for fear of retaliation or losing their job, we have to address those issues as well. So what does retaliation look like? Here's the issue that I want to say under Title VII and Title IX. We cannot retaliate against a person who made a complaint of harassment. Whether it's valid or not, we still have to investigate it. Whether it's found unfounded. Because there's not enough evidence. There were not any witnesses to it. There's no way to corroborate what they, the statement that they made. Then we still should not retaliate against them. I've seen individuals lose a case of harassment and yet still have a claim of retaliation because the way that we treated that individual in the process of the investigation. So also include those who participated in an investigation, i.e. a witness. We cannot retaliate against those individuals. And retaliation looks like any change in their job structure, changing their schedule, isolating the employee, making comments about the employee, threats, intimidation, sabotaging their work, giving them more work simply because they came for all of those issues can be viewed as retaliation. So you just want to make sure that we're cautious about how we treat individuals once a claim comes forward on whether that's the complainant or also a person who possibly witnessed the incident and why do we do this why do we do this not only do we want to have a, a great environment where all people feel that they're included and welcome and free from harassment there are other factors that go involved in, into the importance of increasing your awareness around sexual harassment and preventing sexual harassment as well money so I mentioned early on when we started Preventing lawsuits. We don't want to be sued for doing something wrong to someone who is in our environment. 
because it is very expensive. The investigation piece is very expensive. If there's some wrongdoing found, that can be quite expensive as well. It damages the brand of the organization. So if we think about organizations who've been in the news for sexual harassment, Title IX investigations or complaints, you think about Penn State and those issues. You think about Baylor and, and their issues with their football team. You also think about Ohio State and the issues with their marching band. So whenever we can start using an institution as an example of what not to do, that is damage to their brand. Also, you've got to think about your employees who are here. Most employees, particularly millenniums who are coming on board, have a higher level of diversity and inclusion IQ. They expect that it's going to be an inclusive work environment where we're not discriminating against someone because they may be gay or transgender, uh, discriminating against someone because of their sexual orientation, discriminating against someone because it's a female that's predominantly managing a group of men or in a non-traditional environment or industry. So those are some of the whys why it's very important to ensure that we increase the awareness and ensure that acts of sexual harassment do not take place. And the diversity piece is very important. Diversity is a mosaic of people who bring a variety of backgrounds, styles, perspective, values, and beliefs as assets to the groups or organizations that they interact with. So we want to value all, value all. So my recommendation to you is just do it. Do what's right. Do what we know we should do. Remember the three P's. If you don't want your, your priest or your parent or the police to see it, then just don't do it. Let's do the right thing by all that are involved. So for you, just doing the right thing means knowing your responsibilities, knowing comply with the policies, and procedures that are put in place as part of your homework, go back and read that policy so you're fully clear about what the expectations are and the reporting structure and everything else. Report incidents that you experience directly or things that you witness. Report incidents that are reported to you, whether you're a person in authority or you need to make sure you move it up the chain, make sure you're reporting things. Don't think that they'll just resolve themselves. Cooperate with investigations. Maintain confidentiality. That's very important. Don't start going saying, oh, she made this complaint. And that's, that's when we get into some retaliatory issues. Support the victims and then certainly don't engage in any form of retaliation. And then last but not least, I want you to think about acting. So action changes things. What things do you need to change? What things do you need to do? So it's very important for Marion Military Institute to have the right people in the right positions to ensure that there's some monitoring going on, ensure that their awareness is heightened, that everyone is familiar with the sexual harassment policies under Title VII and Title IX, and that there's no discrimination that take place. And quickly remove those individuals who fail to follow the policies and procedures. And that would be it. So my part is done, is done. So I hope that you have a better understanding of sexual harassment, sexual discrimination under Title VII and under Title IX. I would encourage you to reach out to Laura Lovell if there are any particular questions or concerns, any incidents that you would like to report, or just have a question on whether it falls within um, the scope of sexual harassment under Title VII or Title IX, and she would be glad to answer that for you. If you'd like to stay connected with me, you can catch me on any of the social media platforms at The Career Coach, at The Career Coach, or I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, TakeTips.com. And that is it. I hope you've enjoyed this session.